nationalist group known as the MAW, bombed the Francis Tavern in New York City, killing four people and injuring more than 50 others. From 1974 to 1983, the MAW was responsible for more than 120 bomb attacks on the United States. In reality, we've seen extremism many times in our history, which carries forward to today in what feels like an unending stream of shootings at schools and public facilities. Extremism is manifested in every generation, in different ways and under various circumstances. Ultimately, it is not a matter of religion at all. Religion has nothing to do with it. Every time, it has been due to the actions of misguided individuals who are just frustrated with the world as they understood it. Introducing myself, my name is Imam Azim Akram. I'm the Imam here at the uh, Asadic Mosque, a very historic mosque. It is, it is one of the oldest standing mosques in America. I belong to the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. We are the oldest organization, Muslim organization here in the United States. We've been here since the 1920s. I'd like to begin by first saying that in Islam, we condemn any act of violence, any act of terrorism, and I as an imam condemn it vehemently. These recent attacks in Paris and in Beirut and in Nigeria and all over the world that are supposedly perpetrated in the name of Islam are absolutely wrong. Terrorism is a tactic. Islam is an ideology. There's a difference between the two. When we began this campaign about a year ago, ISIS was just on the rise. And before we begin, I'd like to explain that we use the term ISIS in crisis. It's a play on words. But in actual fact, the word ISIS gives this, these monsters legitimacy. And the word Daesh is what is being used to take away that form of legitimacy from them. So the more correct way to refer to these monsters are a, no, a group known as Daesh. And in Arabic, that translates to something that you stomp on. And that is what we're doing. I applaud everyone that is here today because it's a very brave step that each and every one of you have taken to come here, to take time out of your day. So please give yourselves a round of applause. So what is the Stop the Crisis campaign? It's a campaign that is national, here in the US, it's international in scope. We're in Canada, we're in Europe. We're trying to dispel all these rumors that are pertaining to Islam. We as Muslims, and just to give you a little understanding, even amongst the Muslim community, there's a lot of division. You've probably heard of the Sunnis and the Shias. You've heard of the Wahhabis, the Deobandis. There are many sects amongst Islam to begin with, and we are all divided. That's the unfortunate problem. In Islam, we have to recognize that leadership is key. And leadership can only be a leadership if people trust that leadership. And if that leadership is based on justice. The Holy Quran, the only criteria the Holy Quran gives us in governance is justice. In America, in this day and age, you hear justice for Ferguson, or justice for this and justice for that. This is also in the introduction of the American Constitution. The word justice has been used many times. So I say to all of you sitting here today that Islamic principles are in line with the constitution of this great country. Now, how do we stop the, these group called Daesh? How do we stop them? It's very simple. And it's also very difficult at the same time. Let's not get into the political factors of how this happened and why it happened. Let's look at the history of radicalization within Islam. It's a very recent phenomenon. When you look at the early 1900s, you don't find incidents of these atrocities being committed. What happened? Well, let's not look too far. Let's look around the 1920s in an area that was controlled by the British, known as the British India. There was a gentleman by the name of 
Abul Ata Maududi. He was not a scholar. He was not a religious. He, he didn't know anything about religion. What he was, he was a political activist. And he had incited groups of Muslims using texts from the Holy Quran, using and, and fabricating uh, a lot of stuff to try to gain, gain momentum from the local people. And in doing so, he created an ideology. That ideology spread throughout the Muslim world. Then you have the founding of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt by a gentleman named Sayyid Qutb. Sayyid Qutb was an educated man in the 1940s and 50s. He even came here into America to study and then went back and saw that and created these radical ideas which transferred and led to a gentleman by the name of Dr. al zarqawi who in turn influenced a gentleman by the name of Osama bin Laden, who in turn, you know, history shows what he's done. So no organization, no organization can exist without a population that is willing for it to exist, number one. And no organization can exist without the most important thing, funding. Where is this group getting its money from? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. Most recently, it's been reported that ICE, uh, the Daesh, and see, that's where I make this, uh, 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 I, I do this mistake as, as well. Where does this group Daesh get its funding from? So it's reported that it's been making around $3 million a day. No terrorist organization in the world thus far has been making that much money per day. Oil, looting, human trafficking, selling uh, uh, artifacts on the black market. There are buyers for that. No organization can exist without a culture willing for it to exist. And if you look at most of these terrorists, we find that what is their motivation? We say, well, poverty, OK? We say, well, their circumstances, that's fine. But when you truly look at it, most of these guys are well-educated people. They have engineering degrees. They have degrees from colleges and universities. They have, they come from very well-to-do families. They are the masterminds of these things. It's a political agenda. So by us saying that these terrorists are Muslims in any way is absolutely wrong. It absolutely false. And it spews to what they want, that's their agenda, is to get le legitimization by attaching themselves to an ideology and making that ideology their tactic. So we have to be, we have to draw the, the, the lines there. Now, let's define terrorists. Terrorists are people who instill terror in us. And I tell you, in the Muslim world, the Muslims are terrified. They literally are terrified. How do, they, how do they spread their terror? Let me just give you an example, and it's just recent. There was an earthquake recently in Pakistan. I think it was 2008, I believe. And it was in the hills, the, the hard to reach areas of Pakistan. And a lot of people that were affected, it left 5,000 orphans, 5,000 young impressionable minds. But who was there to help them out? Was it the United States? Was it the world? Was it the UN? Was it any other power? No, because they couldn't fly their helicopters into these hilly areas. It was these terrorists that went in there, walking on their camels or, or their, their donkeys to provide resources and food for these people. They became their heroes. They had access to these places. In the meanwhile, what happened was that we sent money Bookloads of money, we sent clothing, we sent all these things. It didn't get to the people that it had to get to. It was that human connection that had connected with these people. And these 5,000 children are in the madrasas now. Look, we can bomb the, and I hate to use it, we can bomb the hell out of these people. We can bomb them back to the Stone Ages. But there's more waiting in line. What you have to do is you have to eradicate this tactic that they use. You have to re uh, uh, eradicate the ignorance that is within us. Because ignorance leads to misunderstanding. 
Misunderstanding leads to fear. Fear leads to hatred. Hatred leads to anger. And anger ultimately leads to violence. I'd like to play a video for you. You know, a lot of times they say a lot of these converts are the ones that are going back. It might be in that circumstance, but not in most of the circumstances because how can I and what right do I have here standing here as a Muslim tell you all these things? It's because I belong to the largest organized Muslim uh, community in the world. We are in over 206 countries all over the world. We, our, our population is in the tens of millions. Look, to be, all, to be honest with you, if, you, if people spread this rhetoric and think that there are 1.7 billion Muslims all over the planet today, and if each of them is out there to kill, believe you me, it wouldn't take too long. I was the first Muslim my family knew. But this was a good impression for them because they knew what I was like before Islam. And they know now what I'm like after Islam. By adopting those teachings of the Holy Quran, my mom has sought to change. I've read the Quran in English many times. I've never seen anything in the Quran that incites the violence. In fact, I've seen teachings of great compassion, and I think a lot of these misconceptions would go away if people actually picked up the Quran and read it. See, the Quran is very, very descriptive of the Creator, and uh, it emphasizes the importance of recognizing the Creator. Muslim community was established by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed in Qadian, a small and remote village in India. He claimed to be the expected reformer of the latter days, the one awaited by all the major world religions. Founded within a century, the community has reached all the corners of the earth and has been recognized and praised by the global community. And wherever Ahmadis live in the world, you are renowned for enthusiastically participating in the larger community and peacefully living, aside, living alongside people of all faiths, languages, and cultures. All Calgarians, Albertans, and Canadians, and your patriotism. Amadis have embraced Canada, and Canada has embraced you. Your brochure, uh, and I've heard a lot about it from other uh, Muslims, but I think it's an important word to, to be discussed in this forum. Uh, from my perspective, it's, it's an individual's um, living a life in accordance with their beliefs. Um, but I want to hear what your thoughts on the word of jihad is. I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, so the term jihad, it's not a term that was invented during the time of Islam or anything. It was a word that was used in the Arabic language to describe a struggle. Jahada is the root word meaning to struggle. Jihad is one struggle. In the life of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when we see the usage of the word, we find that in one occurrence, that when he was coming back from an ex expedition and going back into leading his daily lives amongst his people, he made a statement that qualified the word jihad. He said, we are returning from a lesser jihad to a greater jihad. The jihad of living our daily lives living our daily earning, being kind and compassionate to our family members and friends and neighbors, trying to live in a civil society. That is the greatest jihad for a Muslim. So it's, you have to understand, it's the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the 1800s that the, the, the uh, Mirza Abulah Ahmad, the founder of the community, made a, a very clear statement. He said, look, if you think that jihad means to brandish the sword and cut off the heads of people, you are gravely mistaken. This is the, the 1800s he, he made the statement. This is the time when there were jihadi movements that were rising up against their own British, uh, the British regime that was in and around the Arab world and the, and the Indian, Indian subcontinent at that time. So that is what the term jihad truly means. It's a struggle. And the true jihad of today is what we're doing right now. 
is educating through dialogue, educating through writing, the, the jihad of the pen, if you will. You said earlier that uh, to stop radical violence, uh, we must eradicate uh, radical tactics and ignorance. Uh, how do you suggest we could do something like that, like directly to people that won't necessarily listen? So there's a verse in the, in, in the Quran again, I like to quote the Quran because it's the scriptures of Muslims, in which God addressing the Prophet says, will you grieve yourself to death that these people do not believe? Because he had a passion, he had a pain that people are not listening to the message. And he was just told, your job is just to remind. And that's all you do, educate yourselves. That's, that's the power that you have. And make sure that when you leave this forum or leave this room, you, you're enlightened. And you don't fall in the traps of what the, um, the other people want you to hear about Islam, about how negative it is, about how cruel Islam is, and how it's out there to dominate the world. We're not in the business of dominating the world. We want to be, and I mentioned this as the Amiya Muslim community because I can only speak for the Amiya Muslim community. We are peace-loving people. We have campaigns that are running across North America in honor of uh, the victims of 9-11, for example. We've collected over 100,000 pints of blood since 9-11 to help, to, to, to raise awareness. We started campaigns like Muslims for Peace and Muslims for, uh, we're very patriotic because Thank we, you. Uh, my name is Farhan Rabani and I am Imam Azam's uh, colleague. I just have uh, a couple of things to add The Khalifa of Islam, his Holiness Mirza Masrur Ahmed, uh, last month he was addressing the Dutch Parliament. And the uh, same question was asked, I believe, by the Foreign Minister of that country. While addressing that uh, question, His Holiness replied that you have to look at the root cause. Why is it that these youngsters are more prone towards being radicalized? He said if you look towards the recent history, back in 2008, the credit crunch, the time when our economy uh, was destroyed. What that did is that there was a great number of students or recent graduates with a hefty loan. They got married, they had families to support, but they had no jobs. The governments tried to somehow bring about some jobs, but even then there was a bias because most of those jobs went towards the elders not towards the youth. And those jobs that did end up towards the youth, meaning youth getting those jobs, even then there was further bias because the Muslims somehow got left out. So now you have a very big number in Europe, young Muslim youth, young Muslims, well-educated, under a heavy debt, with no jobs and families to support. And then comes ISIS, this Daesh. They came along and they offered $5,000, $6,000 a month. These youngsters had no other option to support their family, so what did they do? They naturally ran overseas and they started doing whatever this rogue organization was trying to get them to do. The, the following question is sort of intertwined with the message that Khalifa of Islam is giving to the world. You want a solution to this? Create jobs, real jobs. Empower your youth, empower the youth, and without any bias. It shouldn't be that in Europe or in America, we should say that our jobs are only for the Christian youth or the, the uh, you know, the youth that are here, the Christian youth. It should be based on justice, equal opportunity. That's what America is all about. That's what any nation is supposed to be about. So the root cause of this entire problem is very simple. You know, these people are using the youth that have no financial means to support them, themselves and their families. What do you do? Create jobs, real jobs. Give the youth the opportunity to live on their own so that they don't have to go overseas to fight this, this war that they have in their mind. One more thing I would like to add at this point is that uh, the question had, why do you think it's happened? I have answered part of it, but somebody asked, I believe, that 
what is the overall propaganda? I was trying to make two blocks in the world. In the West, they're trying to show that Islam is a force of evil. And they are here to destroy. And when the West will retaliate, they will show 1.6 billion Muslims. See, did we not tell you that West is against you? Exactly what Imam Azim mentioned in his presentation. So there are two blocks that are being created as we speak. We need to make sure we rise above this political mumbo jumbo. And we let everybody know that we know better. That's what we want to show. You might be wondering, where am I getting this information from? This anchor actually produced the documents that Daesh itself had produced last year, back in November. It was part of their manifesto that this is what we actually want to do. We want to create terror. Now here's the thing, I don't know, maybe most of you might be aware of it or might not know about this, but Daesh is weak. Recently, they have lost most of the territorial grounds that they were operating out of from. For example, in Syria, a major portion that they were controlling has been taken back. They don't want you to know that. Unfortunately, the media is also not showing you that, but Daesh, is on the retreat. They're losing, and they're losing badly. So what did they do? In order to divert the attention, they went into Paris. They created, they, they committed that heinous act. And now the whole world is focused on that. They forgot that Daesh is actually losing. This has been their tactic all along. All along. Whenever they're losing, they do something like that, and then the whole world starts talking about Islam being a force of evil. Islam is now. Daesh is. Daesh has nothing to do with Islam. Facebook page or a website where we can go and. Yeah. Uh, yes, we do. Uh, be your friend. <laughs> sure. Um, I, again, I will urge everybody to register on their way out. Please leave your email addresses. Uh, we will A, send you a survey sometime this evening. We'd like your feedback on just the program content and we also want to know if there are other topics anything else you want to talk about we'd be happy to arrange um, and we'll respond back and we'll send you a facebook link uh, twitter and other social media where we are available yes sir um, do you come out to uh, different faith communities to do this kind of presentation yeah we, we'd love to um, and again you can connect to us uh, through if you register and let us know um, we were actually at uh, a church about a week ago, a few weeks prior to that, we were at uh, another church in Wayne, Illinois, uh, Lombard. So we, we do things in the DuPage County and even outside DuPage County uh, for you know all year round. And, and we invite churches to come and, uh, and have an interfaith dialogue. So in this room, people who will come to your mosque and are, are willing to listen. But I think the broader problem in society seems to be that there's a fear that there masses of people who are going to hear the wrong message about Islam and that they're going to be radicalized. How are you trying to get ahead of that? Right. Or is that just simply too difficult? It, it is difficult, but we're trying. I mean, we've got a social media campaign. We're on Twitter. We try to make sure that we, we, we catch um, certain things before and try to rectify them. We've got MESQ. It's a young uh, writer's guild. We print articles in different newspapers. We write letters to the editor. Anytime anything like that happens, we are proactive in that regard. Through the media, we called all of you guys here. We sent out press releases. If you don't come to our event, we try to come to you. We're streaming live on Periscope. We're doing um, Ustream. We do Twitter. We do Facebook. We try to do as much as we can to get as wide of an audience that we can. Really appreciate everybody coming out. Thank you very much. Some of there's some uh, literature.